Hi, this is Seema Goel with Fab Life 360. We are back with uh, Sangeeta and Shruti, and we have been chatting to both of them about uh, their diagnosis, their treatments, and the support, and all the love they got. I've been saying since I opened the show that they are more thrivers than just survivors. So, and I do have a few more interesting things to ask them. So, please. Make sure that you have got your mammogram this year or at least the year before. And of course, as you be heard in the first part that they both found it through the self-exam. So shouldn't miss it, miss that portion out. And I know we are all very fearful, including myself, to go for the dreaded mammogram because you just think that there would be falls and there would be some news and then you'll have to wait and then it'll just disrupt your life. But then... Whatever is there, is there. I tell myself, like, whenever I need to go for a preventive, I just tell myself, and you guys need to also tell the same things. Whatever is inside our body, it's there. It's not going anywhere just because we don't know. The only thing that will happen is it will increase. It will become harder. We can treat it better, faster, quicker. Maybe we can catch it. Maybe we'll need less treatment. So here's my request. So uh, we'll get back to our conversation with uh, uh, Sangeeta and Shruti. And uh, so Sangeeta, uh, I want to ask you both is about the treatment, especially the chemos. How was it after each chemo, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually? How did you, what helped you stay afloat? Shruti, do you want to go first? Sure, I I can go first. Yeah, Um, for me, so I had 16 chemos. Um, the first four were extremely hard. They were every, um, other week, every other Friday. Um, the last set, um, were, they were not as hard. Um, for me, what got me going is that I would, you know, I had all my chemo buddies, but I think after that, like I figured out, like I wouldn't feel bad that day. I would feel bad if if I got it on a Friday, it would be that Monday that I started feeling really bad. And I just kind of knowing my body and stuff. So that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I would just go, 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 you know? And I think a lot of people worry because they were like, you know, you're driving yourself to chemo and you're going to pick up your kids. And I, but I was, I try to keep my life as normal as possible, Mm -hmm. you know? And I wanted to, like, I didn't want to be a sick cancer patient. If I felt good, I wanted to do everything I could. And I didn't like that people were like, no, you don't need to do that. Don't pick up that. Don't, you know, like they would tell me and I didn't like that. So um, treatment for me was 16 chemos. Right after that, they shrunk the lump. That was the you know reason for the chemo. And then I went in and I did my d- double mastectomy um, to kind of rewind. Um, I found out that I actually, um, it, not hereditary, what is the word? The BRCA um, positive? I, yeah, so I got it, genetics. They did a genetic testing um, and I found out it was genetic and it blew my mind because I'm like, no one in my family has ever had cancer. No one's ever, but it's not that they've ever had cancer. Nobody talked about it. Had they talked about it, it would have saved me a whole lot of testing, you know, and this, and I could have even got mammograms and stuff earlier. Um, so that was another thing, you know, and that's actually why I went very public with it because I feel like, because nobody is talking about this, like, look how it affected me. The minute, like I found out, I told my kid's pediatrician and she was, she just wrote it down, you know, her chart. And she said, starting at age 18, those have to start getting tested. I'm like, great. That's awesome. I need them to start getting tested, you know? And then a lot of stuff I didn't know, like, had I not told my own pediatrician, I like my child, my children couldn't get certain vaccines because they were live vaccines and I was immunocompromised. So I felt like the more people I was telling, the better it was, you know? Um, so yeah. And then after my double mastectomy, I waited, um, about a month and a half and I did a reconstruction, which, um, I guess it was, it's called a deep flap. So they took the fat from my own tummy to recreate two new breasts. Cause you have to remember they removed all the breast tissue. So I was completely flat. Um, and instead of just putting, I, there, you have options. And I chose the deep flap where they just use my own fat, um, and recreated two new breasts. So Um, that was my journey pretty much. And after that, that one was, it was a, I think it was a 12 hour surgery. Um, it was pretty intense. And then from there, um, that, that one, I think took about a month, month and a half, two months to heal. 
completely. Um, and I had to be taught like, you know, how to raise my hands up. My hands wouldn't go all the way up. And, um, I had to have a walker cause I would walk, you know, with the hunch and that. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty one year journey, pretty long journey. That's pretty <laughs> intense. Um, I, um, my chemos were rough and I had been told that the chemos were rough because the kind of cancer I had, they had to go with a pretty strong chemo dose and I had a five centimeter lump in my breast. So I would say I, I had eight chemos every other week and uh, leading up to the chemos, I, I, it, the first week was a little bit of a wash, but the second week I felt better. Um, but after the chemo, I had planned mine on Friday as well. Friday would be fine. Saturday and Sunday would be crappy. Nausea, uh, not sleeping, uncomfortable, sometimes pain. And every time it was something slightly different, just when you thought you mastered it, something else would happen in your body. And then I remember the Mondays after my chemo, generally I'm a manic Monday kind of a girl, right? Go, go, go. They ended up being mute Mondays. Those Mondays, like even if you said something to me, I wasn't processing. So I would have no meetings, no nothing. It was like a silent treatment for me. By Tuesday, I would start to get a little bit more normal. And then by Wednesday, I would spring into work. I would put on my wig. I would have my husband would drive me into town and I would go in there. And I love it because nobody at work, even if people knew, they wouldn't stop me and ask me how I was. They just let me be. And I would get back in the car. And the first thing I would do is rip that wig off because it was like freedom. And that's what happened. Um, the interesting part was um, for me too, I reacted really well to the chemo after all that pain. And I had every plan like you, Shruti, to go through a double mastectomy. In a way, I felt like my breasts had betrayed me. And so I wanted to be done with them. I wanted to stress, start fresh. And every doctor at that point, and a very good friend is a plastic surgeon, she introduced me to other doctors, advised me against that. They said, you're over treating yourself. It makes no sense. Go for a lumpectomy. So I literally had to fight with the doctors and then they convinced me. So I'm so glad I didn't go with the aggressive treatment. I did the lumpectomy. But then I had to go through radiation for uh, every day for five weeks. And, uh, you know, I felt like the worst was behind me with chemo and I didn't anticipate how much, but radiation drained me by now, you know, it was six months, seven months into the treatment. I was tired. My body was getting radiated every day. Um, so just be, be patient with yourself is what I would tell, you know, everyone's journey is different. Learn from others and be, be open-minded, right? Like I was like, I'm done with these breasts. They are going. And then it made no sense. Um, so I'm glad I listened to the docs. Um, and the best thing I remember is the last day of radiation. It was the day before my daughter's birthday. Uh, when I was done with the radiation, they played, you know, celebrate, good times, come on. And we had like bubbles in the small radiation room. So the nurses and doctors were amazing. I built some lasting friendships with, with them. And this was Dana, Dana Harbour. And this was at Dana Harbour, yeah. And Shruti, which hospital was here? Can you share that? Um, I did um, the South Austin Cancer Texas Oncology. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I can just see it. Like, this is all the details are getting etched in my mind. I can just see it like, <laughs> a, like a film. <laughs> okay. So now you both have been cancer-free for a while. Sangeeta, you've been for more like exact five, five years now, yeah. actually. And Shruti, not exactly five years, but almost. Getting, almost, yeah. Almost getting there. So uh, tell us like how your life has changed and what kind of lifestyle changes have you made and what are the lessons learned and how have they changed you internally? Like you feel like a different person or you're the same, but 2.0 version? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can go first. Um, for me, I think, it's the, the day you hear you have cancer. I thought that was it. I thought I was going to die. I remember going to my oncologist the very first time I ever met him. I looked him in the eye and I said, am I going to die? And he looked at me straight in the eyes with the biggest smile and said, no way. And that those two words changed my life because I was like, wait, 
if I'm going to live, I'm going to live, you know? And I feel like I live my life differently now. Like I'm a little more gutsy. Um, I was the kind of girl that used to like, we'd go on family vacations and my family would always have all the fun, my extended family, everyone. And I was the girl that just kind of stood in the corner and watched them have fun. And this, then right after my diagnosis and everything was great, we went to the Bahamas and we did cliff diving and I was the first one that did. And everybody was shocked. I was shocked myself. And I think that's how, you know, my little one, my three-year-old taught me to always stop and smell the roses. So I try to live my life like that now, because to me, I, I, and I was being very dramatic, but I did feel like I could have died, you know, and that was, that's what it felt like. And I got a second chance. I need to really enjoy my second chance now and live it up, live life to the fullest. Mm, your fire and your desire got you there. And I think the you're being steadfast through, even with ups and downs. And Sangeeta, how has, I know you mentioned uh, many times that you know why cancer happened to me and there was a reason and you made a lot of changes, things changed. So please share that. Yeah, you know, and it's just two people uh, going through this journey and very different reactions. I've always thought of myself as a very strong person, a warrior, a fighter. So when I had the diagnosis while I shed a tear, I was like, if anyone can deal with this, I can. And yet I, I felt anxiety, I felt pain. So I had to kind of learn to recognize those emotions. But I would say I'm actually extremely grateful for my cancer. It's made me a better person. It's helped me fight my fear, similar to you, Shruti. One of the biggest fear I had in my life was ever losing my dad. My dad was my mentor, my hero, my guide, my everything. And I think if I hadn't gone through the cancer experience, my dad passed away three years, I would have been shattered. Mm -hmm. And so I've learned, like, you know, there's more to life. Of course, I miss him. Of course, there's emotions. Um, so I feel tremendous gratitude and, you know, whether it's at work or in life, I bring my whole self. I, I ask people to make me time. I, I stop in to check in with my feelings. There are times where I would do things because it was the right thing to do, or because I was going with the flow and now I stop and I'm like, is that what I want to do? Sometimes I'm having conversations with people and I'm not getting a great energy. I'm feeling it's a waste of time. I would in previous life would engage in small chat. Now I'm like, you know what? I'll find a way to conclude the conversation and move forward. And so I think I've got more courage. I went zip, uh, not zip lining. Sorry. I did a tightrope walk. I went snorkeling. I am scared to go into the water. Uh, and, you know, I think um, after that pain of chemo, I was like, it, like nothing can kill you. So, like, you know, I, I think it's made me a more open person and I am grateful for that. Open and you're self-aware, what I can see, and you're, you're doing self-care, you're mindful, right? So those are the things you have understood, like you mentioned earlier, that there were things going on with you couple of years before the cancer yeah but you kind of just let it go and now you're yeah. you're you're doing you're so good with self-care you're aware of yourself you're aware of your body your emotions your vibes your feelings so things like that will not get past you now no true and I would tell every woman take care of yourself you can never give out of an empty cup is what it's simple, but it's just remarkable for me. I always would do something for my kids first and then me. I've kind of reversed. I'm like, let me get myself in a happy mode and then I will give. Same. And I think I give better. I'm a better, I'm a nicer person to be around, honestly. And uh, so I would say, you know what, after my, all the treatment, I had a frozen shoulder. I know you said you were on a walker. I couldn't squat on the floor. I am now doing lunges and I'm doing it proudly, but I had to yeah. work my way to it. And so please take care of yourself, put yourself first. Yeah. And I do want to ask you both quickly, if you can just say, if you have made any lifestyle changes, like you said, you mentioned, you mentioned you are a vegetarian now and, and you work out. Is there anything else that you do to keep yourself like something different that you do now? A lot more? Not different. I said I'm vegetarian, but by choice, I don't like meat. It's not because I changed it. 
I actually drink a little more alcohol than I used to before. So I'm not all clean. <laughs> uh, but I would say I, I exercise and then I meditate and mindfulness. Ah. I mean, that's been my uh, and I uh, coincidentally, before my cancer diagnosis, a few we, a few mu- uh, years before that, I met a yoga mentor who's become my life partner. And so serendipity, right? Stuff happens for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so look at the people around you. They're there for a reason. And, you know, so and they're, they're, they're out there. Every All the energies are out there. Whatever we want, I feel like whatever our desires, whatever we are supposed to get, they're out there. We are just yeah. not grabbing it we are just not paying attention and we have to be in that place to be able to see it and understand and get grab that opportunity and Shruti what Sangeeta just talked about how does you afterwards yeah no I mean what she said every um so once a year I actually go speak to about 800 Indian women and um you know we uh we I talk about um you know, I give the example of like, when you get on an airplane, they tell you to put your oxygen mask on first. So I'm speaking to 800 Indian women. I'm like, how do I get through to them? Because it's true. You can't help anyone unless you help yourself. I didn't mention this. Um, I forgot to, this is very important, but I neglected my doctor's appointments for five years. Mm -hmm. As soon as my daughter was born. Um, and then I was literally pregnant, had her, got pregnant again, had the other one. And for five years, I took them to every doctor appointment, every dentist, every everything. And I didn't go to any of mine. And had I gone to that, I'm pretty sure I would have been in much better you know, shape because I was stage two by the time I found my lump um, and 38, right? So that shouldn't have happened. I should have been going every year. So I go and I speak to all these women and I say, listen, you know, we as women, we love, we we take care of others. We take care of our husbands. We take care of our kids. We take care of everyone. Um, but if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anyone else. And for me, self-care is now like, I mean, I go for regular massages and, you know, just yesterday I woke up and I was like, I'm done. I'm burned out, you know, and I know that now. And instead of getting to that burnout phase, I told my husband, you have the kids all day. I am going to go for a massage as soon as it was done. I went to get myself a juice and then I went to take a bath and I read a book and, you know, and I I wasn't, usually I'd be like, oh, I feel so guilty. My kids, it's a beautiful day, this and this. But I'm like, if I don't get back to a hundred percent, no one's going to be happy in this house. And I've recognized that, you know, and it's not fair to anyone. Um, So I will, if I start getting to that, you know, that phase, I guess I should say, then I, I do, I do take care of myself. I actually also talk, I have a therapist. And we have great talks. Like I just get out everything that's in my head. It's not, you know, anything bad or whatever, but it was just like all my thoughts. I tell her and it's nice to have that outlet. And I talk about that a lot because I feel like having a therapist was amazing for me, you know, and it's very taboo. It's right. Like if I tell people, I mean, some people start assuming, are you crazy? Are you this? Are you, oh, why does she go to a therapist? You know, and doesn't she talk to her friends or husband, whatever it is, it is a very big thing. I mean, believe it or not. And so I write about that all the time. I'm like, it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. Go get help. You know, I go to a dentist for my teeth. I go to a therapist for my mind. It's not a big deal, you know, and that helps me a lot. That is such a huge takeaway. I mean, if somebody has to really get one thing out is that's it, what you both just said, preventive. And of course that includes all those, uh, all those mammograms will come in that, but taking, being self-aware and taking care of yourself and before giving to others, what do you have if you don't have anything to give inside you? Like they're not going to get, forget the best of you. They're not going to get anything out of you. Right. So we have to be really, really vigilant and have that conversation with family and have a backup plan. Like, you know, you have your husband, maybe everyone doesn't have that backup plan, right? Husbands travel, they're busy, single moms. So have a friend or you know, hire somebody or a parent or neighbor or, or do like a swap. Like I'll take care of your kids once every support Sunday, whatever. But right. I think it's really, really good idea to be aware and have a plan and follow that through and take the appointments for the whole year today. Yeah. <laughs> OBGYN, preventive mammogram, all the appointments, just take it because appointments are hard to get now. Yeah. Really hard to get now. So thank you so much. This was very insightful. And as we wrap up the show, I can't let you both go without sharing your proficiencies, your expertise. I would say it's 
number one, have a budget. Whether it's 100,000, 200,000, 50,000, 5,000, have a budget. And at Fidelity, we have a simple rule that we say 50, 15, 5. 50% 50 of your income should be for all of your everyday expenses, your, your, you know, your groceries, your electric bill, your taxes, all of that. 15% put away towards your retirement. It may seem far away, but it's going to come. And 5% for other savings, whether it's emergency saving or another goal that you have. So if you add 50, 15, 5, it's, thir it's, it's 70. You still have 30. 30 is your take home. Do what you want with it. It's liberating to have a budget. If you don't have a budget, you're probably penny pinching all the time. Have a budget and think of it like I'm going to allow myself to do what I want with this much money. Wow. And that can be very liberating. And so, that's so empowering to know that. It is so empowering. But I, because now you've made the decision versus saying, oh, well, we'll see what's left over at the end of the day. Right. right? right. So one is um, absolutely have a budget. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing, the second thing is, you know, I like to tell people have a plan and more than any plan, like think about what keeps you up at night. Mm -hmm. Sit down and ask yourself. Is it the fact that you don't have an emergency saving? Is it that you don't have enough save to buy a house? Is it that you're worried about caretaking for an elder? Are you thinking about, you know, can you afford daycare? So should you quit your job? What is keeping you up at night? Often our thoughts are a mumbo jumbo. And if you write down what are the three things, at least now you know what you're solving for. So I sound like a shrink, but it's financial wellness, right? What are those things that are keeping me up in my finances up at night? And now at least I know how to go about tackling it. Okay. The third thing I would say is ask for help. Know your options and ask for help. Especially during the pandemic, we have seen so many women step away because they're caretakers, right? Or like, how do my husband and I work in the same house while the kids are also homeschooling? So let me quit my job. Understand what you're giving up. You're not just giving up your salary. You're giving up future bonuses. You're giving up your 401k savings. You're giving up, you know, any contributions towards social security. So you're giving up more than just the job. Maybe go talk to your manager. A lot of employers have new policies now. Maybe they're okay with you working, you know, a fewer hours. Ask your husband, sit down and say, is this the right thing for our family? Think about a nanny and how many hours are you hiring a nanny? And maybe that might actually help you because you have a career trajectory or career goals. So ask for help as you think about your financial wellness. You don't feel alone, please. Oh my God, Sangeeta, I could see the shift in your voice and your tone <laughs> while you talked about your passion. <laughs> What that was you, amazing. 25 years, this was like a, a different hat completely. <laughs> really, thank you so much. I think these are extremely useful. Just simplified, you just simplified the whole life in three little things. Thank you. And Shruti, you are a social media influencer. You share your life, your behind the scenes journey. It helped you. Now you have a large following and now you, of course, you're cancer free. So you are doing a lot of good stuff. You're sharing good content, inspiring women, accentuating the positive, sharing about children, parenting, travel, a lot of things. So, and of course, you know, there is a lot of people who want to be in this space. So share some like three of your most favorite social media influencer thing that has, that have worked for you really well. I think for me, um, everyone thinks they have good content, obviously, but I think being consistent with your content, mm -hmm. you come to my page, you know, that I'll probably talk about Austin, Texas, being a mom and breast cancer. And I try to just mainly stick to those things. Um, and I feel like, you know, that has helped me because people want that consistency. They they're following you for that reason. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the number one thing. Number two is I like to pair with people partner with people um, that have similar pages to mine. So if I know, you know, that I like, I'm working with a ton of people that are in the breast cancer space, I'm doing a lot of lives, I'm connecting with a lot of um, people, and I'm bringing those people to my page. Um, and in, you know, their followers are now following me now. So partnering with the right person is huge. Um, and then what was the third thing? I think the third thing would just be I mean, just being true, honest. I mean, the biggest one, 
biggest piece of advice is just being honest, sharing your whole self, um, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't think there was any secret for mine. I think that because I come on there, hopefully I come across as honest and genuine. I think people really like hearing our story and they, and for them, it, it gives them hope. If somebody has had cancer, you know, has, you know, had cancer, has cancer now, um, I think for them, they're like, oh, well, this girl in Austin, you know, she was 38 and she had cancer, but look at her now, you know, she's traveling, she's doing this, she's doing this. Um, so I, I don't think there was any big secret for me. I think that if you get on Instagram and you were just honest, open and putting out good content and keeping consistent with it, pairing with people that are similar to you, that's really all I think. Yeah, so you you are a ray of hope and you are whatever you are doing. You're, you Yeah, I, I totally agree with you because with your pages, with all your, I follow you and different things that you are up to, but there is no like, it's not incongruent content at all. I'll right. definitely say that. No, thank you so much, both of you again uh, for going through this whole journey with me. I don't know how um, it made you feel insight seeing that whole process talking about it also makes us you know a little emotional but I have to say you both are just outstandingly you have just raised the bar in how to uh, you know master the skill and you are an inspiration everyone who's going through any difficult time I won't say just breast cancer or cancer any difficult time there are many situations that we go through and uh, you gave incidents that they can pick on and work from there. So thank you. And well, thank you for having us. Thank you, Seema, for having us. Yeah, wishing you all the best and stay in touch and uh, keep spreading the good word. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Don't miss out on those self-audits as self-awareness leads us to self-care and mindfulness. There is no other way to thrive in any aspect of life without these fundamental attitudes. Feel free to reach out to Sangeeta and Shruti. They are more than happy to help and answer any questions you might have. Shruti can be found on our Insta page, Pajama Mama 512 and Sangeeta's Insta handle at Sangi Moon. And please share this episode with your friends and family and help us spread awareness on this critical topic. If you enjoyed this episode, Please subscribe to Fab Life 360 on either Apple, Spotify, Google, or YouTube, and connect with me through Fab Life 360 Instagram and Facebook pages. And surely don't miss out on my next episode with the one and only spiritual leader, Sister Shivani. May the forces be with you. This is your host, Seema Gowil, signing off for tonight.